Okay, good morning, everyone, and um, thank you for taking the time to participate in this Digital Economic Summit. My name is Ayodele Adio. I'm the managing editor of the Avalon Daily, covenant of the monthly Avalon Policy Dialogue, where we discuss and debate policy ideas uh, with the help of a highly distinguished panel and resource persons. Uh, we also run an online radio called the Avalon Radio, where the focus is on informing and educating our audience about the major socioeconomic and political issues that surround them. The trust of our conversation this morning on the Digital Economic Summit uh, will be how the digital economy can be leveraged to create opportunities for Nigerians, um, to create jobs, and to drive economic growth um, and development. I can assure you that every minute you will spend here will be worth it. Without further ado, let me introduce Professor Adiro Muadishola, who will be delivering the keynote um, over the next 15 minutes, after which the panel uh, discussion, which will be moderated by Mr. Abubakar Idris, um, who covers technology for the stairs business, um, will follow. Professor Adiro Muadishola is the president of Nigeria Computer Society and a member of the screening and monitoring subcommittee of tertiary education trust fund and research fund. He was the former Dean, Faculty of Technology, Obafemi Awolowo University, and currently serves as the director of the World Bank Designated Center of Excellence in Software Engineering. Um, the center aims to create a regionally recognized and acknowledged model that is driven by high quality postgraduate education um, for optic and commercialization of research and technology to advance the growth of the ICT industry. The center will provide the launchpad for startup companies born out of university research activities and collaboration with partnering ICT companies who will have the competitive advantage of proximity and direct access um, to the intellectual infrastructure and output um, of the university. Um, may we please welcome um, Professor Adiro Muadishola as he delivers the keynote. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for that uh, short introduction. Can I share my screen? Yes, please, you can. Can you see my screen? Hello? Not yet. Not, not not yet. We can't see it yet. Can you see my screen now? Hello? It's yeah, it's still not showing yet. Oh uh, why? Your video is your video is even off, sir. The video is on? Yes, your video is um off is not on okay now your video is back on yes can you see it i can see you but i can't see the screen um she has screen and um You can share the presentation with me via WhatsApp, sir, so that you can um, start presentation. I'll just try and put it up from here. Okay, okay. Um, yeah. Can I have your number on WhatsApp? Yeah, the same number that you use, sir. Oh, the same number that you... But yes. I'm not too sure it's on WhatsApp because I wanted to forward the, the presentation to you this morning, but I couldn't get that number from WhatsApp. Let me, let me check. Uh, it's not here. Oh, can I send it to you by mail? Yes, you can. Okay, let me quickly do that now. So I don't know what is wrong with my system here. Yeah. 
sorry for the for the delay. I've done this before. So it's already in your mail now. Okay, I'm checking it out now, sir. Have you seen it? It's not dropped yet. Um, it's not it here. No, it's not here yet. I'm sure it will come. I don't know why it's just taking a bit of time. So I'm hoping you could... Um, let me, let me try. Okay, I've seen it. Oh, it's there now? Yes, it's here now. Are we are we good to go? I'm downloading. I should be ready in one minute. Okay. Yes. Sir. Sorry for the for the delay. Network is always at times. Hello? 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 Uh, Prof, we can hear you. Yeah, can you, can you... Are you able to download it now? Yes, I'm uploading it now. It will come up now. Okay. Yes.
Can you see? Hello, can you see the screen? Now, sir. So it's there now? Sure. Yes, it's there now. Okay. So well, once again, I want to really thank the organizer for giving me the opportunity to be part of this um, 2021 Digital Economic Summit. Um, I'm so grateful because uh, this will give me an opportunity to really also provide information with respect to our own contribution from Obafe Miawolo University in the area of uh, what we are trying to do to ensure that we have a robust um, digital um, economy. So, I mean, I'll just go straight away to the presentation, and I'm sure that you are familiar with uh, most of the things I want to say here. But uh, actually, what we are focusing is on one of the key issues that I think we need to really address together as uh, st stakeholders in this era of a digital economy. And by way of a definition of digital economy, I'm saying that there's no specific digital economy definition, but it includes activities that are supported by the web and other digital communication technologies. And uh, such activities include business, economic, social, cultural, and so on and so forth. Um, there are so many benefits that can be derived from the, from the digital economy, which includes, number one, it contributes to economic growth. It also expands business opportunities. I mean, it creates new jobs for these younger generations delivery of goods and services digitally. So it's now possible for me and you uh, to, to, to do a lot of uh, services online. Transparency, it also improves public services, and there is increase in e-commerce now. And another benefit is that it promotes the use of internet, right? because there's no way you can talk of digital economy without uh, discussing them, um, I mean, without using the internet. So the internet is like a backbone to the digital economy. So these are some of the benefits of digital economy, which I'm sure that all of us are familiar with. But we still have several disadvantages, but I just tried to list about three of them. Number one is lack of experts and trained professionals. In fact, this is one of the key areas that we, I think we need to focus more now because we are talking of digital economy, we are talking of uh, digital technologies to drive our businesses. So we need experts and trained professionals in this area to ensure that um, we have a lot of solid um, digital services uh, online. Number two is food investment. I mean, before you can say, say you want to go on digital economy, you need to spend a lot of money, for example, on infrastructure, for example, on human resources, and so on and so forth. So it's very, very it's capital intensive. But once you're able to achieve your set objective, I'm sure that uh, you can recoup your, I mean, rec I mean recoup your investment. Number three is loss of many jobs. Well, I don't want to agree with this um, disadvantage because even the use of, I mean, the, 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 uh, the concept of digital economy allows to create more new jobs now. But when you talk of loss of many jobs, because we are now using digital technology to do a lot of things, so you need less of human resources. And that's why people claim that uh, it will take away jobs from many people. But I'm saying that this is an opportunity to create more new jobs for this younger generation. And I'm sure that we are going to share a lot of uh, ideas today to see how we can create a lot of more jobs for some of these uh, younger generations. Now, if you look at the population, uh, Nigeria means strength for innovation and robust digital economy. The population is there for us. Am I communicating? Hello? Hello? Yes, sir, we can hear you. Okay, okay. I just want to be sure that I'm, I'm communicating. Yes. So now, when you look at the population, Nigeria means strength for innovation and uh, robust digital economy is the population of the country. Nigeria population is about 200 million with the age bracket between 15 and 54, accounting for 48.9%. Also, another 49% lives in the urban area. This is uh, from the World Bank statistics. So what does this demography tell us? It is a good potential for a demographic dividend. Now, let's look at, at some of the examples. In the movie industry, Nigeria created in Hollywood, a semblance of sort of a US Hollywood. China has Ren Ren, the equivalent of Facebook. 
Now Kenya has mobile uh, money platform. This is the M-Pesa, which all of us are familiar with. It's a leading mobile money channel, not just in Africa, but globally in the world. And this singular innovation brought about by Fodafone is responding for 10% of Kenya GDP. Not only this, it has drawn international focus to the country, further creating attraction for Kenya tourism industry. You know? Now, one area of possible innovative solution is in the area of cybersecurity, because with increasing use of IT, also comes its consequences of cyber threat. So there is the need for us to look at how to develop a lot of applications that help ensure cyber, uh, cyber safety. This is one area that we can create a, a lot of job because we are going digital now. Everything is going to be online. And then we need to ensure that uh, most of our data information are, are really secure. So we need to develop a lot of uh, capacity in this area to ensure that uh, uh, most of our resources are safe on, in, on, in the states. Another area that I think we can still look at is the gaming industry. So this is another taking for attention. Gaming industry is another area that uh, our youth can focus on in terms of developing a lot of games and then push this one online for, 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 for the kids, uh, I mean, to, to, to play around with. Nigeria has rich cultural heritage and in, in, in indigenous knowledge. Tourism apps can come up with document heritages for use by visitors coming to Nigeria. This is another area that we can focus on. Uh, where people are now saying that there's no job. And I'm saying, I don't agree with that because there are a lot of jobs, I mean, with, with, with uh, the issue of this digital economy, but we just need to tap into it. We, talk, we need to create, we need to be more innovative in terms of what we are trying to do. So I'm um, asking a question, when will social media in Nigeria language be developed? We have social media all over. When, we would, when are we going to develop our own social media in Nigeria? This is another area that we, we need to really tap in. So my point here is leveraging on the Nigerian population, let there begin the innovative phrase to create services and products that address our local challenges. Nigeria is faced with so many challenges. Challenges, they say, are precursors to inventions. How come then that innovative solutions are not emanating from the universities, civil society organizations, military institutions to address these challenges? These are questions that we need to ponder on. And I'm sure that we are going to really discuss most of these things today. Now, creating opportunities in the developing world through digital economy. So I just try to identify and highlight so many areas that we have opportunities now. For example, mobile banking. Look at the case of Kenya. The M-Pesa was launched in 2007, uh, and it was uh, done by Kenya Mobile Network Operator, that is Safaricom, in partnership with Fodafone. And we are still going to look at this later because there's no way you talk of digital economy without talking of partnership. You can't do it alone. So these two organizations partnered together and they came up with this M-Pesa, M -Pesa, which is now being used all over in Kenya, even outside Kenya now. We have online retail space. We have our Amazon, Gonga, eBay, and Walmart. Alibaba now have, I mean, have surpassed online sales of Amazon, eBay, and uh, Walmart combined together. So we have all of these as um, online services now. In the area of transport, Example of this is Uber, which is very common in the US. We have the Didi Chung Singh. This is China's answer to Uber. So, you know, for example, now in Nigeria, what are we doing with uh, our transport uh, transportation system? Can we develop a lot of apps rather than using um, imported ones? I mean, we, we need to really look at local content so that uh, we can also move our own digital economy to the next level. Education is there. You have online uh, e-learning software, Students are now paying online, they pay their tuition fee, interact with the banks, and so on and so forth. We have the health, health care, where you talk of um, mobile health, and so on and so forth. Agriculture and fats, you have a lot of um, AI tools now that you can use to drive agriculture. Governance, insurance, hospit uh, hospitality, uh, entertainment, and so on and so forth. These are some of the areas that we have a lot of opportunities if we know exactly what we are doing in this country. Now, I try to look at the Federal Ministry of um, Communication and Digital Economy. I want to also congratulate the federal government of Nigeria, uh, especially the Federal Minister of Communication and Digital Economy. They came up, came up with uh, eight pillars of national digital economy policy and strategy. And uh, what I just did was just to try to pick all these eight pillars from, the, from, from their website and also to look at exactly what they are trying to do. The first pillar is on development regulation, while the second pillar is 
looking at digital literacy and skills. Number three is solid infrastructure. Pillar number four, service infrastructure. Pillar number five, digital services development and promotion. Uh, pillar number six is soft infrastructure. Pillar number seven, digital society and emerging technologies. Why pillar number eight is looking at indigenous content development and adoption. And I'm sure that if we are able to implement all these pillars properly, we are going to have a very robust and dynamic digital economy in this country. And I'm, I'm happy when I read this thing on the, on, on, on the website of the Federal Minister of uh, Communication and Digital Economy, because majority of the activities within the pillars are now being done by in my university through the World Bank grant that we got. And I, I'm going to share most of the things that we are trying to do there. I mean, to ensure that we have a very robust uh, digital economy. And I'm sure that if we can also do this one in some of our organizations, not to leave most of this thing to the federal government alone, I mean, we are going to really achieve a lot. Now, the key issues that I think we can, uh, we can try and address, maybe here today or any time we still meet is, number one, the issue of digital device, divide. This is a big challenge especially in Nigeria, or developing economy. Because lack of digital infrastructure, uptake of digital services, and access to digital literacy in the rural areas is very key. When you talk of digital economy, we are talking of digitally, you are doing everything digitally. So now in the rural areas where the infrastructure is not there, the literacy is not there, how will they be part of what we are talking about? So this is one area that we need to look at. How do we solve the problem of digital device? That is one key issue that we need to really look at. Number two is the local content, creating more digital platform services. How do we begin to embrace locally developed platform and services? Now we have a lot of young, talented students. At least I will show you an example of what we are doing. Here. Very talented set of students, but there is no encouragement for them to really develop. Even when, once those local content are developed, who are those people that will take the, 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 the content? Rather than we using our own local content, we also believe in importing, importing, importing. Meanwhile, we can develop better local content compared to what we are importing. So you will see some of the examples that we've done in OAU, and then we are really moving forward. Pillars of the National Digital Economy Policy and Strategy, full implementation. Yes, we have all this documentation on ground. How do we really implement the eight pillars successively? Because if you, if, if you just have the documentation, and we cannot implement it, then it's, we, are, we are going back to zero. So these are the three key issues that I think we need to really address uh, in terms of the way forward. Digital divide, local content, and pillars of the national digital economy policy and strategy, how we can implement it fully. Now, I, I just want to share an experience with uh, what we are doing in, in my university. Uh, we are trying to set up uh, an ICT park and the, the, the phenomenal challenge we are trying to look at is skill shortage in the area of ICT in general and software development in, uh, in particular in Africa. That is the development challenge. And that is one of the key issues on that digital economy, skill shortage. So we need to really continue to develop the skill of our younger generations so that uh, they can be part of this digital economy. So and the solution we are trying to provide is a center of excellence to train high quality human capacity required in Africa, that's the solution. And then we have this set of objectives for, for that center of excellence. We are trying to develop center of excellence as a training hub in nice city in Africa. In fact, that is what the World Bank asked us to do. And then I'm happy to inform us that the World Bank has already uh, identified OAU as the training hub in ICT in Africa. And that's why we are focusing more on even training other students from other regions apart from our own national, our own students in Nigeria. So we are also trying to develop the next generation of scientists, researchers, teachers, entrepreneurs, and product developers, because these are a set of people that will be useful in the era of this digital uh, economy. We are also trying to stimulate creativity and excellence in research and innovations in ICT with opportunities for industrial, um, industrial research uptake and commercialization. This allows us to now link with the industry Okay, commercialize some of the products we are developing from our center. Also, to expand any opportunities for postgraduate students in all sectors and establish startup ICT companies born out of university research activities. In fact, I'm happy to inform us that based on this project now, we've already set up a lot of um, 
um, startup companies, and they are really doing well. I will show you an example of some of the products they've produced on campus. And uh, what we are just trying to do now is to look for how to commercialize. So with this project now, the problem of uh, unemployment is already over. For anybody that is interested in um, developing uh, his or ICT skills. So these are just the approach that we used to achieve the set objective. Number one, as I mentioned, there must be an enabling environment for you, for the digital um, economy to thrive in Nigeria. There must be an enabling environment. We have already created that one in OAU, and I think that by time in the next few years now, it's going to really be a very good environment for us to I me mean, to work. Outreach programs. This is just interaction with uh, the industry with other regional, uh, other countries within the region and even outside the region. And then we also encourage our students by giving them partial scholarship. For example, regional students coming to Nigeria, we give them partial scholarship because they are not even ready to, 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 to come because of security and other problems in Nigeria. But by the time we introduce tuition fee, I mean, uh, partial scholarship, they, they are able to, they, they are ready and then they came. Free accommodation, we provide free accommodation just to encourage them. So many things that we encourage them to stay. So these are some of the things that we use to uh, to tap a lot of students, even outside Nigeria, to be part of what we are trying to do here. So these are just the results we achieved uh, within the last four or five years that um, we started this project. These are some of the things we have achieved. Far we now have some standard short courses in the area of cyber security, cloud computing, IoT, embedded systems, mobile computing data mining analytics, and so on and so forth. Short term training courses, two weeks, one week, that can uh, enhance your skills in the different areas. Um, uh, we set up about five spin-off companies. In fact, the center registered these five spin-off companies for this set of students, and they are really making wave in the different areas. We have a company on cyber security, there's another one looking at educational software system. We have another one looking at uh, financial services, and then we have Another company looking at IoT, focusing on um, AI to agriculture and so on and so forth. Now we've already established a business incubation center because that is key. This is where you you incubate the ideas of most of this younger generation coming up, and from there we can link up with the industry. We've already also trained 150 entrepreneurs because we are doing all these things so that by the time Nigeria is fully on digital economy, we will have problems of um, skills, shortage of skills. And also we have already created a new set of programs, uh, postgraduate programs in the in, in the university. Um, in fact, I'm happy to inform us that we now set up one fabrication laboratory. Now we now have a fabrication lab where we can fabricate a lot of hardware devices, IoT devices. You will see samples of this later. Now, we have a lot of partners. You cannot do this thing alone without partnership. You cannot. It's not possible. You can't do it alone. Digital economy, if you want to resolve the problem under digital economy, you must be able to partner with um, organizations, with industry, with academic, with um, NGO, and so on and so forth, that are relevant to what we are trying to do. So we have a lot of partners at local, at national level, regional level, and then at international level. So these are, as, as presented here, we can discuss more on that. And we are also expecting more of our partners to join us in what we are trying to do. So this is the environment we've already created. Uh, you, uh, seeing is believing, it's better you even come to OAU and see the environment. We have the research lab, we have the cafeteria, we have um, guest house, everything you, you, you think of in, in a park. So what we are trying to do here is to set up a village within the university where you have everything to yourself in terms of developing your skills in the area of um, ICT as applied to other areas, um, as applied to other areas, be it education, be it um, health, be it agriculture, be it any of the areas. That you want. So the environment is there now. We have a lot of equipment that can be used to train the students uh, to become entrepreneurs. Now, these are some of the products developed by some of our students, by some of these um, spin-off companies. We have the microcontroller. Is This is real. It's in the lab. We have the facilities to do all these ones now. So you have a lot of these students now that can come up with a lot of hardware design, go to the laboratory, and fabricate it, and becomes um, something that can be commercialized. Fingerprint machine is being produced. Now we are working on wireless finger uh, printing machine now. 
I mean, um, fingerprint machine now. So this is just hardware aspect of it. The same thing with the software aspect of it. You have some yes, set of tools also. Address. Sir? Sorry, we, we have about a minute left for your address before we go. Yes, to I'm going to run up now. Yes, sir. Thank so you. These, are, these are some of the, the facilities, environment, and uh, this is one of the company that uh, I mentioned. So in conclusion, I'm saying that in achieving a robust digital economy in Nigeria, government, non institution, and private organization must collaborate, chiefly come together to invest in technology innovation within a frame of well-defined rules and functions which are not mutually exclusive. This calls for readiness on the part of the universities, political will by the government, financial support from private institutions, and leadership by the three actors. Now, these are just some of my recommendations. I, I have about five recommendations here, which I think we can still discuss more. Uh, in order to reap the benefit of digital economy, Nigeria needs to focus on accelerating improvements in the eight fundamental pillars of digital economy. Number two is in training, research, and development. We must focus on this. And then creating an enabling environment is key. Increase investment in ecosystem enabling infrastructure, such as broadband access, backbone networks, and if electricity is another area. Full implementation of the applicable policies is necessary because without the uh, implement, I mean, implementation of this, we cannot move anywhere. Innovation is also key to survive digital economy in Nigeria. Without innovation, we cannot survive digital economy in Nigeria. And finally, I want to ask this question. Can we survive the digital economy without being innovative? So the question is, are you ready or getting ready? So what is our vision in the next 10 years? And I want to round up by saying there is no choice. The world is moving fast with or without us. So on this note, I want to thank you for, for, for listening. I'm just trying to find 10th Fund, National Advisory Commission, and the World Bank for supporting the course of this project. Once again, I want to thank you for the opportunity given to me. And then I'll be part of this discussion uh, when the time comes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sir. Um, thank you for the wonderful session. Uh, I'll quickly hand over now to um, Abubakar Idris, who will be taking us um, through the panel um, discussion. Um, Abubakar Idris, who covers technology for Steers Business, um, over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks so much for um, the pleasure to be here. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, thank you, everybody in the audience, for joining us for, uh, for this conversation. Um, it's really an honor to be here for the 2021 Digital Economy Summit. And I have a lot of, um, should I call them heavyweights, that are on this panel with me, and I'll be introducing them now. Um, first up, I want to introduce um, Mr. E. Abueji, who is the co who is the co-founder and former CEO of Flutterwave. Uh, Mr. E, I don't know if you could turn on your camera or if you can join us soon. Um, yeah, so and I also have on this panel too, Mr. Idris Ayoji, who is also an investor in Portaweb and has been one of the OGs in the Nigerian technology space. <laughs> and yeah, big, big, a big honor to have you here. And I also have here with us uh, Ms. Oluwa Tosi, who is the CEO of Africa. Only Africa is uh, helping young people, young folks to understand how money works, how finance works, and how they can also leverage their understanding to build sustainable wealth in the Nigerian environment. Thank you very much um, to all of you for joining this panel. And I look forward to having um, you know, the knowledge that you have to share. Um, so a brief background to the conversation we're going to be having. So our theme for today is revealing the tremendous opportunities in the night in the digital economy available to anyone, especially young Nigerians. And this is a very strange way to this because you have a lot of young people that delve in deep and deeper into technology. You're also seeing the level of interest that is coming from abroad with investor money pouring in innovative ideas that are being generated by young Nigerians. So it's very, very interesting. Um, at the same time, it's very, very tricky how we should actually go about developing the Nigerian digital economy for a sustainable future for young Nigerians. And look, innovative and very um, inspiring minds that have joined us on this panel. And I just want to give like three minutes to each person to give us their own understanding uh, and also be brief by you about themselves and you know their own understanding about this thing and how Nigerian youth can you know tap into 
the digital economy and the opportunities that are available for them. Uh, so I'm going to start off with um, Oluwatosi to lead the conversation. Thank you. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, like you said, my name is Oluwatosi, and I last saying they are uh, runner financial literacy platform effectively we have a community of about 200,000 people basically just teaching them about their money so i can definitely connect with the theme about digital economy and how this has been a game changer basically leveling the middle ground and giving people access to what they previously did not have access to um the world is changing and we can either sit back or we can actually go along you know and move with the tides and it's a great time to be alive in the sense that i could be sitting down in lagos and basically be accessing an opportunity in kaduna leveraging a technology right or i could be gaining knowledge for somebody sitting down in monrovia again leveraging on technology and over and over again, it's become clearer to Nigerians that we are not limited to the four borders, to the corners of the borders of this country, that it's a global village. So how can I penetrate? How can I get into other markets? How can I create a product that could be serviced, that could be launched in other markets? And how can I tap into all of this, leveraging strongly on you know, technology and especially digital technology? So um, I'm very positive about this and I have great hopes. And this is like my own understanding of it, how we can leverage on what is currently available in order to move the needle. So thank you for having me. All right, thank you, Tosi. Uh, next up, we have Mr. Idris. Thank you. Yeah, hello. Uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me, Ken? Uh, so thank you very much for the opportunity to join uh, this early morning. Uh, so. Firstly, uh, I think it's it's good to uh, be on a talk show where you have people who are smarter than you. You have your professors, you have your bosses, right? So, firstly, uh, Professor Ade, Ade Romu was my undergraduate supervisor uh, some 21 years ago right, at IFE. So, it's glad to see him after 20 years and to still see him going on uh, around the digital economy. Uh, so, people have been at it before, you know, it became uh, as a defined, right? So, very, very proud of you, Professor. And of course, people like uh, Tosi and Inyabuji were really on the ground and getting uh, this done. So we're really, really glad to support uh, uh, the work that all of you do uh, in growing this economy. Uh, so to get started, I think uh, when you look at the digital economy, right? So and I, I'm going to be speaking more from the perspective of an investor, right? An entrepreneur, an investor, which is what I've spent the last 10 years doing, backing good founders who are building uh, this so called economy, building the rails for this economy. Right, that everything then gets layered uh, around for right? it. And so when you look at an economy, right, uh, just like a marketplace, you always have to understand who are the key players there, right? And unless you fully understand and optimize the interaction between these key players, you would not have an optimal economy, whether it's digital or, or, or not, or not, right? And so when you look at the people like are the buyers, right, and the traders, right, you're talking about the entrepreneurs, you're talking about the consumers, talking about the regulators in the market, right, uh, which is the government here. Yeah. Uh, but you're also talking about who's producing what is being consumed or traded in the economy, right? And that is really why I'm glad the university is represented today through Posade Rumu. Because a lot of times when we have these discussions, we miss out the regulators in the uh, in the room, and we miss out the uh, institutions, the universities. And we can only go so far, right, if you don't include those two institutions, right, in a discussion about the digital economy. Because, again, you have the traders, you have the consumers, but you don't have the producers and you don't have the uh, the regulators, right? And all of you having the same vision and working in tandem, then uh, you have stunted growth. And that is something that we hopefully would uh, address in the course of this. So I'm glad to, uh, to be here today. Uh, again, looking at the past decade uh, and seeing the growth and then looking forward and seeing what is just what is still possible, right? And I believe uh, despite all the, you know, naysaying and all the uh, uh, things happening in the larger, larger economy and the world, I think we are onto something, uh, but I think uh, we have the opportunity to work together, right? I think a lot of times there's a lot of, you know, fighting among the different uh, stakeholders and not being on the same page, but I think it's going to be very key for us to achieve our goals that we all get on the same page, uh, for, for the benefit of our young people, uh, and you've seen all the stats, right, about the next 20, 30 years, uh, the population growth uh, on the continent, and particularly in West Africa, right? And if you do not do something uh, very important, if we not all work together to grow this digital economy, I think the repercussions are going to be very negative, right? And so I think, uh, uh, you know, it's a good opportunity that we all have to work together to do this. Uh, so thank you. 
I thank you both for your very inspiring comment. So I'm, I'm going to um, start off with this very um, curious question of mine. And in how, how exactly do people, um, you know, you have this, um, the, the, the bedrock for getting into the digital economy is to have the right skills um, to be able to build stuff or to support people that are building stuff to get things done. And this could happen in multiple ways, uh, whether you're a designer, a developer, you know, a legal practitioner, or, you know, very good um, um, advocate that, that could, um, you know, work with regulators to get stuff done and to, you know, ease the way for companies to build and get around um, regulatory um, um, issues. And this makes me wonder, for the young folks who are coming into the Nigerian um, um, tech scene and who would like to rather come into the Nigerian tech scene, they may not have the, the required experience, uh, they may not have the required skills. How important is um, STEM education um, for them to actually get the right understanding for them to be able to build stuff in the Nigerian economy? I'm going to start off with um, yeah, Tosi for this question. Okay, now speaking about education, the truth is gone are the days where one has to go to like a formal form of place in order to get that education. Education now is now being democratized, right? People are actually going onto YouTube. People are going into communities. People are leveraging on those things. Now you're beginning to pick interest, right? I saw something happening, I think it was about last week, they're talking about how to get into product design and just had to get into like a group, a community, and they were creating a kind of accelerator for that kind of a thing. So gone are the days that you were, if you did not have a certain degree in a particular space, you can't play in that space anymore. That gone are those days. So the way people are actually getting education now has totally democratized. They can go on different platforms. They can leverage on, you know, the YouTube free resources. They can join communities. They can join Accelerator. And how are we then pushing it? So now if you see people gravitating towards a particular style of learning, why don't you put funds there? Why don't you, you know, continue to spur that kind of interest, right? Instead of always just waiting for people to actually go and get a certain degree in a certain line. So if they are willing to learn it in other ways, why not then package with resources as there's a high chance of success. So that's my view on how people are actually getting educated and getting knowledge in that space. Right. Mr. Andrews, I'm going to ask this question from the point of an investor. So one of the good things that, you know, you take into account whenever you want to make an investment is, you know, the investor's background. And to what, what Tosin just said, you have the fact that, you know, many young people these days may not have the qualifications in quotes, and by qualifications, I mean, you know, um, they may not have that, um, uh, what's it called, experience that, you know, is typically ex um, required. Say you went to KPMG or you worked at KPMG or the McKinsey's of this world before you started your own company. So you have young people that want to do stuff, uh, but they do not have that 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 experience. Uh, so, so going from what Osi has said, how, how do you, you know, assess the opportunity and the level of um, experience or should I say the capability of that founder and how do you think you know, investors can work with these guys to help them get their ideas off the ground? So so let me put uh, mm -hmm. Inyakoe on the spot, right? So we invested in in, in 2013, right? Uh, when he co-founded, uh, when he founded Afora, then I uh, co-founded Andela, right? Many people do not realize he does not have a degree in computer science. <laughs> he is trained in media and law, right? At that point, he also did not add, did not have ex work experience either from KPMG from or from anywhere, right? But again, it's shown through his passion, his understanding of the problem, his commitment to working through it and finding uh, finding uh, a solution. I think uh, that's that's shown through. I think that's really the thing about our uh, entrepreneurs, right? So it's not necessarily about the course you study in university, it's good to, uh, you know, again, have a, you know, a, a good, uh, you know, degree and stuff like that because it, it, it grounds you, right? But does not necessarily mean that's a field you're going to work. Some of the best entrepreneurs who did studied physics, studied uh, philosophy and, and stuff like that. But again, I think what we look at as the entrepreneurs is when we ask the question, why you? It's what's your connection to this problem? What is your understanding of this problem? Why are you passionate about solving this problem? What skill set resources networks uh backgrounds uh you know can you tap into uh, in resolving this problem and i think what you studied at, as a course particularly is this list of that right again uh so yes it helps you know for instance if you need something in batteries and you have a uh you know 
a PhD in semiconductor physics. No, it de definitely helps. But generally, I think a lot of time it's really about uh, what else can you bring to the table uh, in terms of this and uh, that you have yourself or you can attract a lot of co-founders and other things. I think that's really the way I would look at it. So again, uh, it, uh, uh, it's 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 a diverse approach, right? Uh, because again, uh, the problems that we solve are very diverse, and so I think I don't think they're locked into a particular course or approach, or you have to uh, uh, work, work at KM, KPMG. And I think also talking about the, I think it was in was uh, tweeting a few days ago about uh, is hope that we could convert uh, the KPMG folks uh, into entrepreneurs. And I, I laughed. I didn't reply, but I laughed because, again, uh, it's a tough one. So everybody's a tough one because, again, uh, there's a kind of mindset that's required to work at KPMG and probably different from uh, one that's required to be an entrepreneur. And you probably have to now work as, as, along a continuum, a continuum, right, where you probably have them first gradually consulting for uh, startups, dipping their foot in water, you know, uh, gradually, then deciding whether this is for them, right? And again, some of them will get converted, some of them would not. So again, yeah, that that's that's my answer to that question. Brilliant, really interesting, really interesting point there, and taking us back a little bit into history. Uh, so you, we have this um, one, one very peculiar thing about the Nigerian, um, should I say, population right now is how many young people we have in the continent. According to statistics from you know, the African Development Bank. Around 82 million um, Nigerians are between the age of um, are, are below the age of 15. Now that is a very very um, significant number because over the next the next decade, what that means is that many of these folks are going to become adults, at least young adults, over the next 10 years. And what that also means is that the level of of um, should I say opportunity that will also come their way would also increase. Um, because these are going to be the, the, the folks who would like to describe as not just Gen Z, but, you know, the, 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 the digital natives. They are going to be growing up in an environment entirely driven by technology. At least some level of technology, even though Nigeria is not there yet. But you would see a, a huge um, impact of uh, technology. So that, that makes me wonder about the level of the kind of opportunities that we would see in the Nigerian environment. And... Um, I'm going to take it from from three levels, or should I say two levels? So you have the consumer-facing businesses that are emerging. At the same time, you also have the enterprise um, um, technology or should I say solutions that are emerging. Uh, thank, thankfully, Iyaboji is here on this call, and he has he has seen you know he has seen solutions being built not just from an entrepreneur side but also from an investor side. So I'm, I'm going to throw this question to the house. Um, so you, you see, you know, the, um, the gig economy blowing up over the last two, three years in Nigeria with ride hailing, with Uber, and you know, with others, um, or other other um, investor, um, should I say, marketplaces arriving on the spot. So what do this, this this innovation? What do they mean for the Nigerian market? And in particular, um, in particular, so you have um, um, the gig economy, for instance, which requires certain skills to be able to play a part in. Well, what, how do you think that young people can actually leverage their understanding, their skills, and actually be a part of the gig economy that we're seeing that is blowing up in Nigerian space? And keep in mind, this is not just software. This could also be hard skills. This could also be engineering. This could also be, you know, physical things like riding a bicycle or riding an Okada on the street. How can they, how can they you know, play a part in the gig economy that has come to stay in the Nigerian environment? Uh, anybody can take this. Okay, let me go. I think um, I, I would add a strong advocate for long-term play. And I think one of the ways that we can actually execute this is by recruiting the parents early, right? Play a long-term game. So you see a lot of people now on Twitter, they're talking about how their kids are already using iPad and all of that. And also, we also have to be, um, we have to be aware of the fact that the income level of parents is actually going to play a role in the a form of exposure that the children are going to have. So also, how can the government also play a role here? So that way, we're able to mitigate the gap that those that do not have that income level to give their children that same exposure 
potential is actually bridged. So it's a long-term play. How do we catch them when they're five years old? How do we catch them when they're 10 years old? Because now we're talking about this huge bulge of population under the age of 15. Once you miss that bracket, then it's harder to teach. It's not impossible, but it's harder. So if we can get them into it earlier, we play a long-term game, we start playing the sacrifices. I see a lot of companies talking about how to teach children how to code, you know, even teaching them gigs, even using um, using tools and all these other things. But how do we exp how do we explore that number so we are able to see a geometric growth, right? So in summary, how do we recruit parents? Government bridging the gap for parents that do not have the income to give their kids that exposure. And the last but not the least, playing a long term game and doing it consistently. So this is not a project you throw money at and then you withdraw the funds. It has to be consistent. So that's my contribution. Right. Right. You want to say you want to add something? Hello, oh, Professor Shula. Hello. Yes, Professor Shula. Hello. Yeah. Yes. Uh, John, okay. In addition to what, in addition to our, our contribution, I want to say that, for example, there is uh, an NGO in Nigeria now uh, called um, Digitest, and what they do is just organize training for um, kids between the ages of five and twelve, uh, like two, three weeks training. In fact, uh, I hosted about uh, 250 or such um, uh, uh, kids uh, for about three weeks in effect, where they are exposed to digital marketing and so on and so forth. Very, very interesting. So that's number one point. The second aspect where we come, I mean, we come in as university uh, lecturer or university management is once immediately you gain admission to the university now, Compulsorily, we expose you to ICT training, minimum two weeks. Now, from there, we now identify those that are really interested. It's not compulsory that you are in computer science. Most of the most of the startup companies that we registered, some of them, the MDs of those companies are not from computer science. One of them read law, the other one read ed education. And they are really, if you see this wonderful kid, I mean, uh, student, you will believe they are, they are in computer science. No. But you see, the fundamental is that. There must be the yeah. environment for them to operate. That's just it. If the limited environment is not there, forget about all these things we are talking about. And that is why we are really emphasizing that in IFE now. I don't have any other business again in IFE that continue to create enabling environments for these kids to thrive. I'm telling you, if you have all this facility on ground, the students are ready to learn. Even if you leave them alone, they are ready to interact, to learn, and do a lot of things. Most of the time, what I did was just to create that environment for them. And I don't even stay in the lab. But by the time you get there another two months, believe me, they are already doing fantastic work. So the emphasis is more, for example, now, if what we are doing in IFE is being replicated in other institutions in Nigeria, be it colleges of education or polytechnics or any 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 of these institutions, honestly, you can really spread this gospel around. around. So that is just my own contribution that we are encouraging other institutions to, to look at our own model and see whether they can also what I mean, what we are trying to do. We have a lot of them in different now with those ideas, and they are ready to go to anywhere. Okay, let, let me take from there. Yes, yeah, so thank you, uh, Prof. And again, I think uh, I must comment what's going on in IFE. Though I must also accuse you that you're not publicizing it enough, right? Even as an alumni, uh, alumni of IFE, I have not had this level of detail until now, right? And I think uh, that's very important. As part of digital economy, I think it's also sharing what's working, so that other people can benefit from it, you can replicate and scale it, and also leveraging a, 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 your alumni too, right? And we don't have to come to Ife, we, we, don't, we all know the go to Ife is bad, right? But at least with Zoom, with all these other tools, I think uh, there's so much connection that can be, you know, just even mentoring uh, the entrepreneurs themselves, even connecting them to potential investors and uh, the global world. I think there's, uh, there's a lot that, that needs to happen uh, in that in that instance. And I, I think once that happens, when that full connection to the industry happens to the existing uh, uh, investment entrepreneurship world in, uh, in in the on the continent and Nigeria happens, and that will also scale your work, right? And that becomes replicable because for instance, a few years ago, I was in Senegal at uh, the gas, uh, I think it was Gaston University, and again, it'll be yeah. something very similar to this, where they are, you know, what on campus people are creating companies, and you know, several from Facebook to Google, they now have many offices located just next to the campus because they are tapping into that uh, entrepreneurial talent there, and so naturally now it's scaling. It's people 
it's being replicated across the, uh, the board. So I think that's probably where uh, uh, there still needs to be some work. Uh, and again, I can't give you work puff, but again, <laughs> that, that's why I think it needs to happen. Thank you. Right, interesting. Very, very interesting point there. So I'm, I'm going to go um, a, a little to one conversation, which is um, the opportunities in the digital economy. And uh, we, we noticed that, you know, um, the, 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 the MVG community based on investor appetite, we realized that fintech is one of the hottest places where investors are throwing money. It's one of the hottest places where opportunities seem to exist right now. But there are other places, uh, other industries that are also, um, you know, um, witnessing it um, that can also be disrupted by technology or that can be that can be improved by technology. And some good opportunities include, you know, um, agriculture, logistics. Uh, those are two areas that you know technology can actually play a significant role. But at the same time, we're saying that um, the, the the level of um, should I say appetite that investors and even entrepreneurs have for this space is not being marked by investor um, you know, um, enthusiasm. And that is a result of in the many challenges that exist in this space, not just in infrastructure, but also in expertise. So the question that I have is, how can you know, young people, how can people get into the space of innovating products for, for the agricultural scene? And that includes you know, for the multiple value chains that exist in, in, the, in the agricultural sector, from storage to logistics to marketplaces to for selling um, products. So from, from your own view, um, Mr. Idris, can you tell us, like maybe share, share with us maybe some innovative um, models that companies are developing and the multiple ways that people can play a role in the agricultural value chain using this um, technology? Okay, so thank you. So before I answer that directly, so again, I know there's this a lot of noise around FinTech. But I think sometimes it beclouds what else is happening. So fintech is not the only, only thing happening, right? Again, because uh, you see a lot of funding go there, sometimes people think uh, it's just the only thing being uh, supported. Uh, but as I would also say, if you look, at, look, at, look across the continent, uh, it's also different, right? When you look at a place like Kenya, there's probably more funding coming into the agri sector than fintech. If you look at a place like Egypt, there's more money coming to e-commerce and logistics than, uh, uh, than, uh, than fintech, right? So again, uh, but the way, from an investor's point of view, the way we look at it is this. When you talk about digital economy, my basic premise is this. Africans, by nature, are tr traders. Before technology, they've always engaged in commerce, right? That's what we have always know. Technology has only just come to enable it more. And so if you don't look at that and say, okay, Africans, by nature, are going to be uh, commercial, are going to trade with themselves and with others, then you now say, how do you enable that uh, trade to happen seamlessly? And that's where payments come in, and that's where logistics come in, right? And for, for Africans to do that, they need to be well educated, they need to be healthy, and they need to be well fed. And that really describes the six sectors we focus on at Lofty in Capital, right? It's uh, logistics, it's commerce, so that's e-commerce, e-commerce, s-commerce, well, commerce, right? It's logistics, it's commerce, it's payments, uh, fintech, but also health, education, and agri food, right? And again. Those are core uh, focus, right? Sectors that we focus on. And so, when you now take a part of that, the agri uh, stuff, food security is going to be big, right? You've seen it with water security, with the different things. Uh, you saw that with COVID, right? Uh, and uh, pre COVID and then post COVID, COVID. And so, the question is now how do you ensure uh, 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 food security for yourself as a nation uh, and this continent, right? You now start looking at how do you use technology to improve your yields, right? So again, a lot of time we're talking about fancy stuff and, uh, you know, in digital place in agri, but I think it's not from the very basic stuff. From, if you compare the yields on our farms in our agri sector in Nigeria to a lot of advanced countries, it's very poor. So it's not from what kind of seeds are you using? What kind of practices are you using? How are you monitoring the, uh, the, the weather, right? How are you getting forecasts that then affect uh, what you planned, right? So I think, uh, the, very core, you know, those basic uh, pieces are very important. And it was things as simple as I think extension. When we're going up, we used to hear about there being extension workers, right? The government will send extension workers in different parts of the country uh, to actually help them uh, with knowing what to plant, when to plant, when to harvest, and avoid 
was always lost. Now, over time, because of different things, that's not existing anymore. Right? You don't say AI as much about, as about that. Most of the people are even trained as essential workers. You don't want to go to those rural areas for security issues and stuff. But how do you leverage technology? Just yesterday, I was speaking with Bola Lawal, uh, founder of Scholar X. And they, and they had built uh, the, uh, on Len, 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 Lenham. So that is an uh, app they had built on feature phones, not even smartphones. On, on phones running on, on, on chaos, right? Where in Pidgin and in local languages, they were actually training extension workers. And I was really blown away, right? So just imagine on, your extension workers on his basic phone, right? So not even fancy phone. And he's been taught the, uh, uh, and the farmer, right? So the senior workers, the farmer, farmers, people in rural areas being converted into extension workers to work with uh, the farmers there, right? You know, very appropriate, very locally appropriate, right? So you're not having to download big videos or anything on feature phones. And again, I think these are some of the things I, I'm seeing, even beyond all the ones that we know around, you know, uh, we know the finance uh, play in I Greek. We've seen all the drone stuff and things like that. But I was, I was just blown away by how simple that was and how effective it could be uh, in rural areas. And I think that's really, uh, for me, a, a, key, a key part. And if we look at our own portfolio, actually, you know, probably I've done about six, seven uh, 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 sort of investments. And as we actually speak, I was, as we were doing this, I was chatting with my boss, uh, Kola, you know, who had just visited our ranch. So we have a livestock ranch in uh, Nasarawa. So even as though we do tech on one side, we also run a huge ranch that's also now tech enabled in Nasarawa State. So again, we do fintech, we make one from fintech, but we also put a lot of it into agriculture because we need to eat. <laughs> interesting. Uh, interesting points there. I don't know if he is back on call. Hey, where are you? Okay, uh, I guess it's, it's not back on the call. So we're, we're almost out of time, but I just want to throw this um, last uh, question and around it up for each person to answer. So, the, the focus of um, the digital economy and you know the realization that it can help to reduce uh, or should I say improve opportunities for people one at the same time it can also help to grow our economy by you know transforming the way we do things and make things more efficient and more productive at the same time we also have the realization that if we enable um, the digital economy to be should I say we can reduce the divide. Um, to access the digital economy in Nigeria, we can also help more people to move from their current level of income to greater levels of income in the, in the, in the long run. So that, that makes me um, I'm curious for your own view, for your own views to so this last question that I have. For you, what is the singular most important thing that Nigeria must do to enable digital economy to impact more lives over the next 10 years? If president could just, you know, Give that give their final thoughts on this question and then we'll call it a wrap. Uh starting with Professor Shola. Yeah, well, thank you. As uh, if you listen to my lecture, my focus is more on building skills. So you need to build capacity of these younger generations. Without those capacities, there's nothing you can't achieve anything in the digital economy. So you have to build the skill. And how do you build the skill? You create the enabling environment for them to thrive. That's just it the skill to enable the environment. And that's what we are trying to do in effect. If you are able to get it right from there, I'm, I'm sure sky is going to be the limit. Skill development, and then you create the enable environment for this student to try. And then the policy, there must be full implementation of this policy because by the time you train most of these students, they develop their applications. Now to get investors is always a problem for them. So many of them are hanging around with a lot of products but without any uh, investors. So I just want to say that skill development, enable environment, and also, and also the policy. We, we we allow this thing to thrive in the next 10 years. Thank you. In the next 10 years. Thank you. Yeah, I think we got right. me. I think we have me finally. <laughs> I've been fighting a war with this internet. I apologize. <laughs> no problem. We are almost on, uh, just giving them um, Final remarks from um, panelists. Uh, so yeah, um, I think we'll, we'll come back to you before we round up. Uh, so, um, Kosi, maybe give your, your final thoughts. Um, okay, I'm with Prof on you know building the skills, but I think another thing that is also um, very important is that we need to also keep parroting the significance of it, right? So people, it's easier for people to latch onto something when they believe in it. 
right? So if you can build like a cult-like movement, let them say, let them see the impact, let them see the story, right? So storytelling, believing in it, then it's easier for them to adopt it. So we need to be very aggressive about the amplification and then for them to actually believe that this thing is truly going to work, this thing is truly going to be the, you know, the, yeah, it's going to really serve its purpose and it's easier to adopt. Yeah, right. so just, just to add to that, right, so we can move forward until we build our universities and get them fully involved. And so I'm really on, on with pop there. That's the way you scale, not just by all these small startups alone. The universities, when you spend four years there, five years there, you come out prepared for the economy. But beyond that, when you create that talent, you need to connect them to opportunity. And we're not yeah. doing that enough, right? And I think yeah. that's uh, somewhere we need to improve and connect them to opportunity. Uh, uh, yeah. Thank you. Right. Unfortunately, I will not be able to ask any more than one question. So I'm just going to run and ask this very crucial one. Um, so a few days ago, and I think uh, Therese has also mentioned it, a few days ago, you tweeted about, you know, um, getting McKinsey um, um, consultants to come and to start startups. And so that actually ties into, you know, the last question that we had here, which is what exactly is the single most important, the uh, single most important thing that can be done to get more people to technology and you know build for the future and so i'm going to connect the two so i do not know the context i do not know the inspiration for for that tweet but i feel like there is more that you that, that you want to share with us um you know for that tweet and how that can help young people to get into technology yeah first of all let me let me let me um, um apologize I, I i've had a really tough time with the internet and um and and that has uh, impacted on the experience such that i'm only able to join you at the end and before i answer that question i will crave the indulgence of the organizers to just just quickly wrap out a few thoughts i already had had noted down to share um every year um i started from last year the world bank does something called the digital economy diagnostics report and i really encourage everybody to go and read it and what it talks about are the five pillars I know the ministry has eight pillars, um, but I prefer these five pillars because from country to country, you can get a sense of where you stand. Digital infrastructure, digital platforms, digital financial services, digital skills, and digital entrepreneurship. Now, I mean, um, I, like most people who read these reports, I, 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 I contend some of the definitions, but I think directionally they're going in the right area. And when we talk about the digital economy and what's required, I think it's very important that our government is taking these five points extremely seriously and having a consistently evolving to-do list of things to, to take care of on all these five things. I'm going to name one priority for each of these and then I'll answer my brother's question. Digital infrastructure in Nigeria has unfortunately been a Lagos affair for way too long. We have five landing cables in Lagos, which is atrocious, along one two kilometer road along the Atlantic. The Southeast and the South South have been denied, even though they do have a much larger shoreline where we can land cable. We can't even talk about the crime going on in the North as far as internet connectivity is concerned. So there has to be, and I know there is, the National Broadband Plan, but we have to go beyond the national broadband plan, perhaps to actually direct investments. So many providers, so many of these infrastructure providers are focused on Lagos because of purely commercial elements. But we have instruments like USPF that should be able to spread this across the country. So that's digital infrastructure. Digital policy and platforms the minister is doing the best he can with NIM, and I think it's a fundamental building block for the digital economy. If we don't know who you are, we can't serve you well, and we can't also exclude bad actors. So there's a lot more that needs to come alongside that, including devices. I think we have prioritized um, um, platform identity and software over devices. Even if you connected everybody, you still need them to have devices to be able to access the connectivity and leverage it. There's no reason in this country why every university student cannot go into a uni the university and get a laptop as part of their matriculation requirements. 
they can pay that laptop over a couple of years but there's no reason why that should not be the case right when you talk about when we do the connectivity we should be centering these things on schools so that we can build out our institutions then we talk about digital financial services although the world bank tends to think about it from the point of view of payments i tend to think about it from the point of view of capital how can we make it easy for somebody who doesn't know anybody to access capital and perform with it that's a very important question our financial institutions are failing in this respect but i'm hoping that newer models can be encouraged to step into the gap so people can get 100,000, 200,000 that they need to set up their businesses for success. Digital skills, right? I think that sometimes we're setting the bar a bit too high, thinking everybody should do Andela, when in reality, what we need to be focused on is how do we build um, a platform where it's possible for, in reality, how do we build a platform where it's possible for for people to um, uh, um, gain even smaller skills like AI tagging and things like that. You know, it's extremely important. Um, you know, they can, if they can do better labeling, AI tagging, those are building blocks to all the other things that, um, that they might need to get skills on. And then finally, digital entrepreneurship. Personally, I'm not focused on this area. I think we're doing very well there. Um, I think, I think if we can fix all the other stuff, digital entrepreneurship will blossom, whether we like it or not, because it's a certain, it's a certain character of person that gets involved in digital entrepreneurship. Back to the question you asked, what's the single most important thing we can do? Tell the consulting companies to stop wasting their time consulting governments and corporations with declining revenues and get into the education business. KPMG, McKinsey, PwC will serve Nigeria better if all they were doing were churning out a thousand graduates a year that had core skills that consulting tends to give you. That's my belief. I realize it's radical, but that's my belief. Thank you. I thank you so much e, for both the points you've made um, at the start and for your very interesting answer. I'm going to hand over back to um, the organizer now. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you so much for being a part of this panel. Thank you. You're mute, are you? Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Oh, great. Uh, thank you, Abubakar Idris, for um, a fantastic moderating session. Um, I'd like to thank each and every one of the panelists for bringing such insights to this deliberation. Thank you, Mia um, Boyaji. Thank you, um, Ms. Tosin. Thank you. Mr. Ayode Jibello, and of course to Professor Adishola, um, we really appreciate your time um, on a Saturday morning to do this with us. Um, hopefully we can take the conversation um, further and um, we can hope that we can all work together to produce a digital economy that works um, for many, many Nigerians to create jobs and opportunities that can scale and improve our economy. Um, you know, in the short to, to meet term. So thank you once again um, for joining the Avalon Policy Dialogue on the Economic Summit. And I hope that we can do this again um, sometime in future. Thank you so much um, for your time. Thank you. Thank you.